Thank you, Wesley. Uh, this is my second time here, and I'm uh, very happy to be here again, so thanks for having me back. Uh, one of the conversations I was just having with David and Wesley uh, at dinner was uh, how, and what I like about this class is that it's not just about design, but it's about the conception of like the idea all the way to selling it, um, which is what this lecture is about. And so hopefully uh, I can give some insight into what we do here and it could help you. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> Voyager VR is a virtual reality education company uh, started by myself and uh, my business partner, Jessica, who she'll be here any second. <clears throat> Our first product was called Stonehenge VR. And basically, it is a virtual reality tour of Stonehenge. Uh, Jessica, um, can we... We didn't have a chance to plug in, charge some of the various things that need to be charged. So our first product was uh, Stonehenge VR. And basically the story goes is that uh, oh. I had tried um, virtual reality for the first time at a convention called E3 back in 2013 and it blew my mind and I changed, I wanted to change careers and so I taught myself how to program. And within six months of learning how to program, we created Stonehenge and then it ended up becoming a museum exhibit. Which, this is the entrance to the uh, exhibit. This is a, at a museum in, uh, in Overland Park, Kansas and this is kind of one of my uh, favorite photos because it's like one of the things that I'm most proud of um, because I never really expected to be in this position designing uh, museum exhibits. And another reason why I'm so proud of it is because it's right next to a giant dinosaur. And so that is one of three casts of the first Tyrannosaurus Rex uh, ever discovered. And so it's just kind of an interesting path that we took because before this, we made YouTube videos. <clears throat> and uh, so after uh, I taught myself how to do this, and we, um, like I said, we went into the museum We also became a launch title on HTC's Viveport, which is, um, how many of you are familiar with virtual reality? Okay, like half the room-ish. So the, the, this is probably the HTC Vive is um, kind of the most popular headset, if you will. I guess it would be like the Nintendo of VR at the moment. <clears throat> So this was a big deal to be able to, to be a partner and for them to use Stonehenge as an example, the software that we developed as a great way to use their hardware. We also recently, uh, most recently, uh, were featured in the Unreal Engine Showcase. Does anyone know what the Unreal Engine is? So the Unreal Engine, great is uh, it's a game engine. So if you're playing a game like uh, Gears of War, Fortnite, anyone, any Fortnite players here? Battlegrounds? Okay, got, got a couple. So this is, um, it's basically, we, we use this video game engine to create, you can really create anything with it, not just video games. And so we used it to develop um, uh, this educational software. And so um, this was kind of a really kind of, uh, important milestone for us. Um, and so to have the support of the people that build these tools that allow us to make these things has been very cool. As you can see, they gave us three heart emojis, which means they really do love us. So this is, um, <laughs> this is funny. So we just bought this Vive uh, a couple days ago, and we opened it up. And Jessica was like, oh, that's funny, Stonehenge is in here. <laughs> uh, 
And sure enough, it's like right up there. So when you, when you buy this thing, it's like actually kind of marketed in the box. And by the way, we haven't redeemed this coupon code yet. So if one of you takes it, I'm going to know who took it. Okay. So the lecture is called The State of Virtual Reality in Developing Multiplayer VR Applications. Um, we do actually have a demo here that we're going to be doing tonight. And it's going to be multiplayer. So somebody's going to be playing on that computer over there. And then somebody's going to be in the VR headset, and you're going to be interacting together inside um, a virtual reality. So I'm going to try to get through the lecture as quick as possible so we can do as many demos as possible. And also, I'd love to answer any questions if any of you have any. So virtual reality has been called the final medium because once we are finally able to recreate a world we can live in digitally, whether realistic or abstract form, what medium could possibly come beyond that? I just think that's kind of an interesting statement, and I do believe it to be kind of true, and it was one of the motivations of me wanting to change careers, because it's, it combines ev like everything, you know, from you know, music, sound, movies, storytelling, programming, all that stuff. It's, it's really... Um, well, it's immersive. <clears throat> so <clears throat> real quick, I'm going to go over the topics of the lecture. So we're going to discuss how we got started in virtual reality, what is Stonehenge VR, how Stonehenge VR was made, how VR will affect education, a brief history of VR, VR terminology, Voyager 1 design goals, which is our new product that we'll be testing here tonight, and our business and de design philosophies. <clears throat> so, but before I get into all that, I'm gonna quickly tell you a story about how I got started in virtual reality and it actually is not just two years ago when I taught myself how to program, but actually it goes all the way back to high school when I had this ponytail. So this is me and I'm working on, this is the Quake 2 engine and I'm building, this is like a project I was making for this, the science fair. And basically what I was trying to do is I was trying to rebuild my school uh, digitally in a computer. <clears throat> And so this was like the little desk chairs here that I was modeling. This is the school, uh, you know, like the map of the school itself. This was one of the teachers that we took a photo of and scanned him in. <laughs> he really got a kick out of that. This is, yeah, this is my computer teacher here. Looks real. <clears throat> so, oh. Which wire? Oh, are we back? Okay, great. <clears throat> so here's me demoing it at the science fair. That's the talking to the judges. These are the kids playing it. And so we thought it was a, we were a shoe in, but we weren't. And this is me getting the bad news that I was getting a participation award for building my school in a virtual reality application. So my interest in this has been there for a long time, but it, the technology wasn't there really, you know, to, to do it for real, to really do virtual reality. And so that's, the moment my heart was breaking and I decided that this was not going to be my future and it's all that guy's fault <laughs> but really though I have to accept some responsibility there see there was a bug in the software that I had written and basically because it was built in a game engine a lot of the blood and gore was still in there even though I like I hit it all 
And there's a part in the application where you're kind of taking the tour of the school and the principal would appear and he would talk to you and he would tell you like, oh, you're standing in front of our library right now. And you know, then he would tell you about whatever you were looking at. Well, anyway, we're giving the demo. And uh, out of nowhere, the principal starts exploding. <laughs> and, uh, and that was it. That's why we lost, because I blew up the principal in into a bunch of uh, blood and guts. So that's the first lesson of this lecture. Don't do that in front of uh, the judges. <clears throat> and that's me, very sad. So I keep losing connection here. Is, this, is everything OK? I'll try not to lean on it. So that brings us to here. Because around that same time, my brother actually started going to this very school. And he was uh, in film school here. <clears throat> and um, so I actually kind of grew up like walking around here, even though I didn't go to school here. I went to like the film festivals and stuff like that. And it was real inspiring stuff back then. So I ended up becoming a filmmaker. <clears throat> I made a, one of the first viral videos on the internet called How to Be Emo in 2004. <clears throat> this is before YouTube even existed, but now it's on YouTube, of course. <clears throat> uh, I started a video production company uh, where I would produce pilots and stuff like that for um, you know, NBC Universal, E! and whatnot. I've done game trailers, worked with new media companies, and like I was saying, I start, we, Jessica and I, so this is my lovely partner here, we created a YouTube show together called Best Game Show Ever. And we had a lot of fun and it was great. But um, about four years ago, I started to realize that there's you know, just something more probably that I should be doing. And, um, and so that was when we got the idea uh, to start making virtual reality applications. And so that was when the we came up with the idea to do Stonehenge. And so I have a short little video that sort of describes that, that journey here. So this is actually on um, HTC's YouTube channel and it's kind of like a quick story about us. So we're gonna take a look at that now. share with you the impact those moments have had on Voyager VR in 2016. In November of 2015, Christian decided to teach himself how to develop VR software in the Unreal Engine over a three-month period. Shortly after, he created our first educational experience, Stonehenge VR. Since then, we've heard from many people about the lives we've touched, have been featured on some of the biggest tech and entertainment blogs, had television network A&E film a short documentary about our mission and what it's like owning a VR company together, became a launch title on HTC Vive's storefront, Viveport, and have installed VR exhibits in two of the most iconic museums in the country. As you can see, we've had a busy year. But how did this journey start? After the first build of Stonehenge VR was uploaded, we received a touching message from Curtis Robinson, whose terminally ill father was finally able to virtually tour Stonehenge, a travel destination he had always wanted to visit, but never found the time. My dad was diagnosed with liver cancer very late. I think that he'll be able to live the rest of his days knowing that he's seen history as a slice of something that for him is really pretty spectacular. We also got reactions like this one from a woman that grew up near Stonehenge but didn't really appreciate the historic landmark until now. It reminded you of like the beauty of things. I feel like me personally, I guess I take things for granted maybe, but that I was like, wow, it's, it's an amazing creation. This 
was the spark that inspired us to keep moving forward in this direction. Shortly after that, we managed to catch the attention of the Pacific Science Center in Seattle, who invited us out to set up a public exhibit of Stonehenge VR. Once there, we were placed within the Science Center's iconic laser dome facility and their history of 3D room. This is the history of 3D room. While we were in Seattle, we even had an amazing opportunity to actually go to Valve Software Headquarters and demo Stonehenge VR in the same room where the original HTC Vive was first created and tested. Another huge milestone for us was working directly with HTC themselves, who asked us to be a launch title on their storefront Vive course. In addition to that, they commissioned us to translate Stonehenge VR into Mandarin Chinese. And have included us in several holiday bundles, including Christmas and Valentine's Day. And that brings us to where we are now, the museum at Prairie Fire in Overland Park, Kansas. Stationed right next to one of only three casts in the world of the very first Tyrannosaurus Rex ever discovered, this is our second museum exhibit this year. And what a treat it's been to see people of all ages learn about Stonehenge through our application. So in conclusion, we wanted to say thank you to everyone who has supported us through our first year. Thank you for believing in us and sharing our vision of the potential of applications like Stonehenge VR. We have more exciting opportunities around the corner and we can't wait to update you on what's next. So that's kind of our promo piece. Typically, if we're um, trying to work with somebody new, impress somebody, whatever it might be, that's like what we'll send in an email, you know? It helps to have a good trailer to explain what's going on. Come on, baby. Okay, so what is Stonehenge VR? <clears throat> this is uh, one of the aerial photographs that I used um, to recreate it. So it's a fully interactive virtual guided tour of the ancient monument Stonehenge. It's completely immersive. You feel like you're there. You can, you can explore and see the monument at different points in history and perspectives never before possible. Um, so like one of the things that um, is unique about doing this in VR versus going there in real life is that you can see it at different times in history. So like it's obviously it's, you know, dilapidated now. There's, you know, pieces of it, pieces of it are missing. But in virtual reality, you can sort of see it as though it was, you know, 4,000 years ago, which is, you know, pretty unique. And you can learn while being inspired, which is kind of a big thing for us. It's, we don't, it's not just about facts. It's about um, creating an emotional connection for somebody. You know, because you, when you actually care about something, you probably want to learn more about it than if you didn't, right? So why was Stonehenge chosen? So it was created by a single developer, so the scope of the project had to be something one person could create. I was learning how to do it, I was also doing it by myself, and I was doing it with no budget. So it had to be something, a concept that was achievable. Like if I would have chosen like um, the Roman Colosseum, for instance, it might have been too hard to model all that by myself or find the models for it or whatever so that it had to be something that was um, achievable. Uh, Stonehenge is a location many people know but don't know a lot about. I hear sometimes people say that it's just a bunch of rocks in a field and that's kind of one of the reasons why I chose it. Because when I was a kid, my dad, he would, he, I remember him showing me this book and it had Stonehenge in it. And he looked at me and he goes, this is why you need to study 
looking at this photo of Stonehenge and he said, you don't want to be the type of person that says, so what, it's just a bunch of rocks in a field. And as I was doing the research on it, I realized that it is much more than that. There's a built-in mystery to it. No one knows why, really. There's some theories. No one really knows how, necessarily. There's some theories. Um, it's an important part of human history, and it's beautiful. So how Stonehenge VR was made. It's developed in the Unreal Engine that I kind of told you about. It's kind of the premier gaming engine. Um, like if you look at the top 10 selling games on the market right now, like probably eight of them are built using this technology. Um, all the rocks were modeled in uh, Maya and then some of the other models were done in Cinema 4D. Uh, the reference materials I used were uh, aerial photographs, 360 panoramic photos, and real-world measurements all resourced online. A question I get a lot is, have you ever been to Stonehenge? No, I've never been to Stonehenge. Um, and people are like, oh, did you go there and film it? No, it wasn't filmed. It was all just, it's, it's all just 3D models, and um, all the measurements are found online. So this was originally not developed for the Vive. So what makes this headset special is that you can walk around in this room. So you'll see later on, like you can um, put the headset and walk around and it's like, you know, you're actually kind of walking around that space. Before that headset, there was one like this and uh, <clears throat> you couldn't walk around. You would just use like an Xbox controller to kind of like move your character around. So it was a little, little bit more simplistic. So that took two months to make. And then the, the HTC Vive version, which is the one we're showing today, uh, was another four months. So six months total. The original design goals for Stonehenge were something, uh, I wanted to create something that everyone in the world could enjoy. A lot of the things that I was making beforehand um, were very niche. Like it was about subjects that like only I and maybe a couple, you know, hundred thousand other people might enjoy whereas like this it's you know part of human history so theoretically you know anyone in the world can enjoy it so I wanted it to be something anyone could enjoy it um, useful and entertaining to people of all ages I'm happy to say that at the museum there are kids that are six years old that go in and do this thing and there are grand their grandparents who are 80 that also do it and they all enjoy it um, and so yeah part of our goal and strategy with this is to just make sure that this technology is being used not just for entertainment but um, you know for something that is beneficial in other senses uh, it also needed to train first-time users so when you guys put this thing on it's not going to be completely obvious you know exactly how it works and it takes some time to get used to it so it, um, so we had to make sure that Anybody that goes into this museum, whether they've ever, whether they've ever played a video game or not, is going to be able to do it. <clears throat> um, one of the big things with VR uh, is people want to see things that they can't experience anywhere else. So just taking like a regular game and just putting VR on it isn't always like the best answer. You sort of want to try to develop things that really like you couldn't do in any other way. Um, and so I've always been proud of the fact that I feel like this, what we have made, it's not a game and it's not a movie. So what is it, you know? And so it is something really that can only be done in VR or experienced in this way. Um, it also needs to run in real time in the Unreal 4 engine, not 360 video. Um, do you guys know what 360 video is? I'm sure, like on YouTube, there's like these 360 videos. You click on the video and you can drag and look around and stuff like that. And some people call that VR. But um, really, this is um, doing it in a game engine like this is the most realistic and best way to do it. So <clears throat> making something with this technology has been a very 
uh, interesting experience because we truly are like some of the first people, you know, in the world to be uh, experimenting with it. And so seeing people's reactions, I know David and Wesley, we've talked about um, how much they love watching people's first reactions. And some of the first reactions we got uh, were pretty amazing. So this woman here, her name is Jenny. She grew up near Stonehenge. She had visited it many times as a kid, and she never cared about it. Um, she's a friend of a friend. I, I, I called around various people that I knew, and I was like, hey, I'm making this thing, this Stonehenge thing. Do you know anyone that's ever been? Because that was kind of the big test is, I've never been there, so I don't know what it's really like. And so having her come over and do it was a, a big deal, and I was, I was nervous. And she ended up having like one of the most amazing reactions ever. And I'm sure you read here, she said it reminded her of the beauty of life. And when she said that, I was like, holy crap, like that's pretty amazing. Um, and so after that, I kind of knew that we were on to something with what we were doing. You saw a brief um, clip of the story about Curtis and his father. Um, his father was, uh, Curtis's father was uh, terminally ill with cancer. He had always wanted to go to Stonehenge. He never got the opportunity to go. They downloaded our software and his father got to experience something that he probably wouldn't have ever been able to do otherwise. And it was like this very touching moment for them. And this is also something that happened very early on um, with what we were doing. And that's kind of what led us to um, doing the museum exhibit because people saw these, these interviews and these news clips and wanted to know more. Um, and so these, these early pieces were, were really important. The last thing was is that people said that they enjoyed it more than playing the, the games, um, which we were kind of shocked by because typically, I mean, like most people would rather play a video game than like watch, you know, some educational thing or whatever. But the technology is so much fun, it's so immersive that even educational things can be really, really engaging. And so we just feel like if it's going to be entertaining regardless, why not have it be um, impactful as well? So why are people having this spiritual, if you will, experience? The only thing that I can really think of is that when I first tried it four years ago and I put the headset on and I looked down and I was in another person's body. That was weird, but it was awesome. And I was uh, just immediately taken back by it. And so afterwards, like people genuinely describe it as a spiritual experience, if it's a good one, you know? Um, And so, yeah, so that's, I, I think, um, well, yeah, yeah, I guess that's about it on that part. So how does VR change education? <clears throat> so one of the theories that we have is that, um, When you're reading a book in high school and you're looking through a textbook and you just see a photo of you know, the, the subject that you're studying, you don't really have a personal connection to it. It truly is just a photo of a bunch of rocks in a field. But if you actually feel like you're there, like you, like you went on vacation there, you spent time there with your family, you took photographs, you told stories, you, you know, told jokes, whatever it might be, and you form this connection, um, you're going to care more about it. And so we feel that that's kind of the, one of the main benefits of ha doing something like this and having it in schools. So here you can see an example of the software. <clears throat> you can take virtual photos 
and selfies. And then when you're done, you can look at them on an iPad and then email them to yourself. So like almost like you actually went on vacation kind of thing. This is uh, one of the kids at the museum doing it. So the museum's been a great opportunity for us to kind of test some of this stuff out. Ultimately, we would love to be in schools, um, and this has been an amazing first step to kind of trying out this software for the first time. So why is a new form of education needed? Well, because the world is changing very dramatically, and it's going to be continually changing very dramatically in the next 10 years because of AI. I'm sure you guys are, have heard of AI. <clears throat> VR and AR is going to be changing the way we experience the world. Space travel, probably going to be an interplanetary species at some point. So the, everything's changing. Education needs to kind of move along with it and advance along with it. So one of the things that the lecture, the title of the lecture is uh, The State of Virtual Reality and Developing Multiplayer Applications. Stonehenge wasn't originally multiplayer um, because it's, it adds a, a much larger layer of complexity to the software development. Um, but VR with other people is... Uh, a much better experience than being in there alone. And so we've invested a lot of time into creating this, creating a multiplayer experience. Now this, what I'm about to show, is not ours. This is something we recorded about a year ago um, in, in another social VR application. But I just kind of want to show the video to show you the kind of like fun that people have. I can see you. You can? What do I look like? You look like a robot. You oh, really here, I'll show you what you look like. Follow me over here. Follow me over here. Uh, Follow me over here. I don't know if I'm allowed to walk that far. I can't. Oh, shit. Yeah, I... there you go. Wow, I'm beautiful. Oh, I love me. Yeah, man. Hi. Um, Can you guys hear me? Oh, hello. Oh, oh good. OK. okay. Yeah, man. cool people. Yeah. I had a ton of excellent conversations. So there's just a little example. People, uh, they tend to be more open, more just um, kind of like uh, the self-consciousness thing is not there, you know, because they're not you don't, you're not worried about your insecurities or anything like that. You're a robot. All right, we are getting through this. Okay, so a brief history of VR. So people have been trying to make virtual reality for some time now. Um, this is called the stereoscope. It's a 3D device made out of wood, some glass, and 3D photos actually existed uh, over 100 years ago, believe it or not. There's an example of it. Family Guy did a little bit on it. Would you like to see it for yourself, Brian? Yeah, I would. Good, because it's going to blow your mind like the Stereopticon did to Americans in 1910. Hey, I'm in New York City. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. What's going on here? <laughs> so, I actually happened to have one here. So, this was actually my grandmother's. 
believe it or not, grew up with this thing in, in my house. Come from a long line of virtual reality developers. And uh, so yeah, this thing was pretty cool. And what's really interesting actually is, so you can do VR with your phone. If you, t if you take your phone, you can stick it in this little piece of cardboard and these little lenses here, and you can kind of like look around and it looks 3D and everything. You can put your phone in that thing and it'll work, it, which is really interesting. So, in the 1950s, there was the Sensorama. This thing, I guess, it did aromas, vibrations, wind, all kinds of things. I don't think it worked out too well. <clears throat> The 1980s were pretty awesome. So what's, what's interesting about this, the, the technology in the 80s, it's really not that much different than what we have now. Um, really, the, all the concepts are exactly the same. It's just uh, the computers just were not p powerful enough to really do it correctly. But um, this is a little example of uh, some guys in the 80s doing this stuff. A discovery that will change the way people live, work, and play. A discovery that will open up an entirely new world, never before explored by man. So come with us today and join us in exploring this new world, the world of cyber. In a moment, I'd like to take you on a tour of an AutoCAD architectural model, but a tour rather different from any you've probably had before. So let me put on this cyberspace gear and calibrate the system. The imagery appears to completely surround the user in three space. The operator can explore and interact with the virtual environment just as if they were touching real objects. Possible applications include long distance control of robots and monitoring or management of large scale integrated information systems such as might be found in future space stations. Associate other the other goggles. The other are the goggles, the head-mounted display. Mm -hmm. You have uh, the computer tracks this as you wear it. You have two small TV sets inside that uh, show you what the computer is right. displaying. And it really allows you to be in the middle of the computer graphics. It allows the graphics to surround you and gives you a real feeling of, yeah. of being there. Artists. Well, I'm definitely in, in cyberspace. And you can see I'm moving my hand. You can see my hand in cyberspace also moving. Okay, we're, we're going to have to get out of this world, guys. Let's go okay. oh, sorry. So ours is a little, it's like a step above that. The 90s, kind of more of the same. There was that giant thing. <clears throat> you saw it in a lot of movies. The 90s were supposed to be the beginning of virtual reality, the real beginning. Nintendo came out with that red thing over there. It was actually, a, uh, it's called the Virtual Boy. It was a giant flop. <clears throat> it's kind of like one of the bigger mistakes, I guess, Nintendo made. So, but people wanted it really bad. It looked like this. But in 2013, everything changed with the Oculus Rift, which is this thing right here, this one. And I invite you all to come take a look at these if you want. Um, but yeah, so what's different between 2013 and the 80s or 90s? What changed? So basically, cell phones and video games <clears throat> are the two technologies that really drove this forward to where um, it was commercially viable. These things are these screens are these sc cell phone screens are being mass produced, and the graphics processors are also being mass produced. Um, and these two things together are basically what makes a VR headset work. So if you open up one of these things, it's basically a phone inside of there. All the technology that's in your phone that when you move it around and it can sense that you're moving it is 
the same thing, the accelerometer in there is the same thing that tracks your movement now. And then video cards, graphics cards. This is a graphics card probably similar to what I had in high school. Actually, it is the graphics card I had in high school um, that I made that virtual, re the high school, the virtual reality high school thing with. And this is what games looked like in 1996. And this is what a graphics card looks like now, so the ones in here. And this is what video games look like now. And so it took the evolution of this stuff you know, over the last 20 years to be able to make this a reality. Very quickly, some VR terminology. There is, we're almost done, by the way. Um, so there is high-end VR, and there's mobile VR. Mobile VR is OK, but if you haven't done high-end VR, you really haven't done it. Um, basically, one of the biggest key words in, uh, in, v in the VR industry is something called presence, and essentially it just means that you truly feel like you're in another place. And there's several things that contribute to creating presence. One of them is resolution. So the higher the resolution in the screen, the more realistic the image looks. The second important one is tracking. So that's the inside of these little boxes. Those actually aren't cameras. Um, those are shoot lasers, essentially, um, that triangulate. They hit the sensors on the headset, and it's able to triangulate your position in the room. Um, and so accurate tracking is very important because if you turn your head and the screen doesn't also move in this, at the same time, you'll get sick and it won't feel real. Frame rate's very important. So the faster the screen is refreshing um, the screen, uh, the more fluid the motion is, the more realistic it feels. So you have to have a very powerful computer to do this. Field of view is also important. So Basically, when you put the headset on, you sort of see like, it's almost like you're looking through binoculars. So the wider the, wider the field of view, the less it looks like you're looking through lenses and the more it looks like real life. There's two different engines that people create this stuff with. There's the Unreal Engine, which is what we use, and there's another one called Unity. Unity is typically um, good for smaller teams. Um, supposedly, it's easier to use. I've never used it, uh, but Unreal Engine, I'm in love with it. Absolutely in love with it. Um, if you are getting, if you are interested in any of this stuff, look into both of them, I guess. Um, but definitely give Unreal a shot. Oh, so okay. So this next video is an example of how you can design VR in VR which is sort of what we're going to be doing today. Um, and this is an example of some of the tools that are actually built into the Unreal Engine. On one of my motion controllers, I have this laser pointer that will let me interact, select, and move objects in the environment. To move myself around the world, I just grab onto the world and pull myself toward the point I want to move to. I can grab onto the world with two hands to scale myself up and move around the world more quickly that way. I can also rotate the world around me by grabbing onto it with both hands. Now I want to get a bird's eye view of this area over here, so let me do that. Now I want to see what this looks like from the player's perspective, so I'm going to teleport to the green arrow over here, rotate the world around me, and now I can see as if I'm a player in the VR world. So the next feature that we're going to show you I'm really excited about because I know people have been look asking for this functionality for a long time. I want to add a lighthouse to our scene, but I'm actually going to build the 3D asset right here, the 3D model right here in Unreal. So I'm going to start with this plane and make it red. And I'm going to switch into the new mesh editing tools. So I'm going to enter polygon selection mode, select the polygon and extrude it to create a base for our lighthouse. Next, I will in the set to create a slightly smaller polygon inside the first and start building the walls. I can make the lighthouse as tall as I need to, and so that looks like a pretty good height for our scene. And I'm just going to keep working on this before I talk more about my editing. 
So mesh editing in VR is a lot of fun because you get a great one-to-one -one relationship between what you do with your hands and the results that you see on your mesh. And even though we're showing these tools in VR mode, this mesh editing is actually available in the desktop editor as well. And so notice as she does things like that inset, she can control exactly where that's going to end up, which is great. And with a little bit more time, we actually prepared a version of this mesh with, with more time to polish it up to our full level of quality. We're gonna go ahead and uh, swap it out here in a second, just as soon as we finish the kind of basic shape to give you guys a better idea. There we go. Looks pretty good. Let's just find a good spot to put it, and then we can move on to the next part of our demo. I brought up all this clip here. Yep, looks good to me. All right. So now, why don't we go ahead and uh, teleport down back to the beach where we see those surfboards on the ground over there. All right. I like this board here with the sun on it, so I'm going to jump in and catch a wave with it. It's actually jumped right into testing the game. And there's my board, and there's my lighthouse up there on the beach. And here we go. So that's a kind of an example of, again, how you can design these worlds for VR in VR. I know last time I was here, several people said they wanted to change their major and career after kind of seeing some of this stuff. It's, it's you know, I could see why. I could see why. So, uh, quickly, the last uh, kind of part, last thing on this section is uh, so there's two technologies that are very similar that are both kind of coming into their own right now. Obviously there's virtual reality, but then there's another one called augmented reality. The technology works almost exactly the same. The only difference is with augmented reality, there's um, the screen is actually in the top of the headset and it projects images onto these lenses and you actually see 3D models in real life. So I would, if I had one on right now, I could see you guys, but there'd be like, you know, a cartoon character sitting in the middle of the room walking around. So that's what I, that's what I mean when I was saying um, the world is going to be changing uh, in a pretty dramatic way because at some point these things will be very commonplace and we'll all be living with cartoon characters like this or like this. I know someone was in the medical field here that was talking to me about this stuff, so this would be a kind of a cool example of that. And this is a famous example from a movie called Back to the Future 2. This is kind of what I'm talking about. Still looks fake. Hi, Brian. Okay. <clears throat> How are we doing on time? Where are we at with time here? Eight. It's eight. And what time are we wrapping up? Nine thirty? Oh, whenever you want to. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, so okay, so now let's get to now. Um, and what we're here to do today. So we're working on a new application. Like I said, uh, it's, um, it's a multiplayer uh, VR application. So we're taking that Stonehenge experience and we're turning it multiplayer so that um, families at the museum, groups of friends can all go in there together now and experience this as, um, as a group. Um, and so we have a kind of an early prototype of this new experience um, that's also um, going to be, it's going to have multiple new locations. So it's not just going to be Stonehenge, it's going to be Egypt and many other things. So here's kind of a little example of, that's me and Jessica. There's Jessica, I'm picking her up now, placing her down there. 
So basically Voyager 1 is going to be kind of, it's going to be a hub of experiences. So you'll be in this kind of space station area and this is where you'll be picking the different locations that you might want to go to. Like I said, it's going to be multiple users and multiple new experiences. So some of the design goals that we're aiming for with this as we're developing it, um, as I said, you know, we've only, this is probably, we've been working on this for about two months now. Um, so what you're going to be seeing is very much, uh, yeah, an early, early prototype, um, which I can explain more about later. Um, but one of the big things is not just that it's multiplayer, but it's going to be multi-platform. So meaning that somebody on a desktop computer can be inside VR with the person in VR. Um, so that's, so, and one of the reasons for doing that is um, because there's a, lo a, a larger audience. A lot more people have computers than they do VR headsets. There's only about a million of these out kind of in the wild right now, whereas, you know, there's hundreds of millions of computers. So essentially by doing it this way, we're opening it up to a much, a much larger market. Um, we still want it to be accessible and engaging. Um, so one of the things that I'm kind of toying with the idea uh, about with um, the way the experiences uh, are presented is that um, there might be, I, I think, the story that you go through, there might be like an easy mode and a hard mode. So say like the 80 year old grandma at the museum might, you know, she might do the easy mode so she doesn't really have to interact a lot. But maybe like a younger person, you know, in their early 20s might do the, um, you know, the more interactive mode. So that's kind of how we're going to keep it um, exciting, but still accessible to everybody. Like I said, it's going to be multiplayer and um, it's going to be all in one app so that we can release um, kind of updates very quickly and keep um, adding new content. So now we are on the very final part. So I'm just going to go over real quick um, just a couple of my philosophies in doing this whole process. Would you guys be interested in hearing? Yeah? Yeah? OK. All right. One thing I always say to my friends is doing something is better than doing nothing. Um, Basically, when, when I was like in my early 20s doing uh, the filmmaking thing, I would get people, I'd go on these meetings at studios or whatever, and I would think that like, oh, you know, they're finally going to make my movie. And then I would sit there and wait for months and nothing would happen. And it's not like I did nothing that entire time, but it's just like, um, I guess my point is, is that we are, even when we now with um, what we're doing now, even when we get a contract and we're and and we're waiting for you know that project to start, like we started on this next project before we even had the financing for it because it's just like I just figure that it the energy always goes somewhere, you know, and so the worst thing to do is just do nothing. Find a problem that you want to solve. Um, this is a very common uh, bit of advice. Um, basically, you know, for entrepreneurs, um, you have to be trying to solve a problem, right? And so, like, if you look at kind of what we were doing before this, we were making YouTube videos about video games, and that's not really a problem that needs solving. There are millions of videos on YouTube already about video games, right? And that, it's not that there's anything wrong with that, but there's a legitimate need for um, a new way of um, teaching people. Um, and so uh, when you're really trying to, um, you know, to help people, uh, doors do open more. And that's been very beneficial. This is kind of really along the same, the same, um, the same idea. Um, but like I was saying, you know, my brother went to film school when I was like in middle school, and so I, I thought that was what I wanted to do. 
and it's I don't regret taking the path that I did because it's what taught me to be a storyteller and to create these sales reels, these trailers, all these things that I use to sell what we do now, right? So it wasn't a waste of time. But the reality of it was, was that I truly love this technology. This is really what I cared about the entire time, but I wasn't listening you know, to what was in my head. And um, it's, it's extremely valuable because it's, um, when, when you really truly care about it, people can tell. And, and like I was saying, it's like, I went from knowing nothing about this to in six months, installing a museum exhibit next to a dinosaur. You know, and it was because I was listening to that, you know, voice inside, you know, so to speak. Um, one thing that Jessica and I believe very strongly is that you can teach yourself virtually anything by modeling the people that came before you. There's a thing called the 10,000 hour rule. Basically, <clears throat> there's a, a theory that these people like uh, Mozart, Tiger Woods, um, that these, these people that are considered like uh, masters are born with it. But the truth is when you look at their stories, Tiger Woods' father was a golf teacher and was training him from the time he was two years old. Same thing with Mozart, his father was a composer and he was helping him compose music from, you know, by the time he could walk, right? And so there's a misconception that you need to be born with this knowledge to be successful with it, and I don't believe that to be true. So when you open yourself up to that idea that you can train yourself to do anything, you can. The reversal of that idea is that you can't be an expert at everything, so your network and team are very important, and that's true. Persistence, this is super duper important. Never give up, fire emoji. And the reversal of that would be sometimes you should give up. And I'm going to give you a quick example. I made that How to Be Emo YouTube video in 2006. No, 2004. And it was like one of the first viral videos ever on the, ever on the internet. And I would go around to studios. like uh, I went to Disney and a few other places and I would pitch this idea to turn How to Be Emo into a feature length film and that was like my goal, that's what I wanted to do. And it didn't end up working out. Now, you could say I gave up, you know, because I never, I never, I stopped pursuing it. But I feel like that would have been kind of dumb to try to make a movie called How to Be Emo in 2018 because no one cares about what emo is now, right? So there is a time when it makes sense to stop doing that thing that make, doesn't make sense anymore and move on to something else. But if it does make sense, like what we're doing now, you have to go through a lot of crap to, to be successful. Like it's, it's a lot of fun. What Jessica and I were very fortunate to be doing what we're doing, but we're also like, it's very frustrating. It's very stressful a lot, you know, and we, look at each other and we go like, man, this is probably where most people would quit because I feel like I'm going insane right now. But we know better. We know that if you just stick with it, good things happen, like being here right now. We're happy to be here. Be a renaissance man or woman. So it's like, how do you come up with this idea for what to make? You have to go live a life. So an example would be, if you wanted to be a movie maker, don't just watch a bunch of movies, because then you're just going to like copy what you saw. You have to go live a life, and then you'll have a story to, to tell. And one example um, that I love is the woman that we work with at the museum. Her name is Candy Merrill. She owns the museum. She's very successful. Um, well, she owns the museum with her husband, Fred. Um, but uh, she was an Olympic gold medalist. And when I found that out, as we were you know, starting to work with them, I'm like, wow, this woman must be an amazing human being because it takes a lot to win a gold medal. And so that was more interesting to me. Not the fact that they you know, had built this like, real estate empire and bought you know, you know, and built this museum and all this kind of stuff, but the fact that she had done that was, was you know, valuable to me. So. Um, 
yeah, it's just you got to go out there and get experiences, real experiences. <clears throat> I'm going to skip that because I want to get through that. OK, here we go. So allow your limitations to be an advantage. I just want to give a quick example. By the way, there's only 10 of these. So <clears throat> um, one of the big things is being able to take what might be a, a disadvantage or a limitation and turn it into something awesome, right? So. With Unreal, it's very difficult to test multiplayer when you're doing the software development. So what, because you have to have, you have to have two headsets, you have to compile the software, then you have to upload it to Steam, then you gotta download it from Steam, and then you both gotta put the headsets on, and if one thing was wrong, you gotta do the whole thing over again, and the process takes about two hours every single time I test something. So what I did was, is I, program the whole thing actually to work just on a desktop computer and basically all the code works exactly the same so I test it all just on a desktop computer and we don't have to go through this whole long process and really it was just done to um, to be more efficient with the development but it turns out that now we not only have a VR app but we have a desktop app too which is opening up a bigger market right so this limitation of like not being able to test VR efficiently is what led us to developing this whole new thing that might open the market up to us quite a bit more. And the last thing is find a way to enjoy it all. Because it's, um, yeah, it's just there's, you end up spending, you know, 12, 16 hours a day doing this stuff and it becomes your life and you start sacrificing things and you stop calling your friends and your family and you just, you know, you're working all the time and uh, you just have to enjoy that part of the process too. It's important. You can't just wait for like the, um, the success to happen. Thank you. All right, who wants to do some VR? Yeah. Okay, so it's gonna take a second to kind of get this set up. So if you wanna take a bathroom break or whatever, now would be the time. So there's two things we're showing. One of them is the museum tour. Okay. And the other one is um, a thing we call the sandbox mode, which is where you're gonna be building your own ancient monument. So that's going to be two different demos. So do you want to do the tour or do you want to do the building? Is it pretty difficult to do the building? It's not. It's, it, well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. What's your experience level with like video games and stuff? I mean, I play Mario Kart. You play Mario Kart. <laughs> that sounds like qualification to me. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Who wants to do the tour? You guys, what are you doing? You're missing an opportunity here. Who wants to do the tour? OK. OK. Great, get over here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Wait, wait, wait. He's doing the tour. He's doing the tour, and then you're doing the thing afterwards. So, 10 minutes. Yeah, Jess, why don't you kind of take over for a little bit here? Real quick, by the way, <clears throat> people in the audience, you will be able to see and hear what he's seeing. So it's not like he's going to be like off in his own world and you're not going to know. So, you know, there's something to watch here. So is this? That is my headset, so I think that can This one goes over here? Yeah. Or, no, I think. I think this one was this one. Let's go into Discord. Hello. 
Hello. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on the right one here. I believe so. All right, so. OK, great. So you'll see here. that when I walk this headset around, it actually moves through the scene. You have two remotes. One of them is going to teleport you around. You use this big circle, press that in, aim it where you want to go, let go, and then pull the trigger to pick things up. Thank you. 
located in Yorkshire, England. It was constructed during the end of the Neolithic period and was finished around 2300 BC. Stonehenge is one of many stone ring monuments in the British Isles, but it's by far the most well known. Archaeological evidence suggests that it began as a burial ground and was then constructed over hundreds of years in four major stages. You will witness the sunset during the mid-winter solstice. It is theorized that this alignment with the sun and the monument was to signify the new agricultural year. The ability to cultivate the land is what gave the Neolithic man the resources to undertake a project of this size. Worship today, 
It would have served for a variety of different events, burials, weddings, or festivals. While several of these theories are tough to discredit, many believe Stonehenge was initially built as a shrine to the dead to memorialize the lives of their ancestors. I'll tell you what, I'd love to continue the conversation. Welcome back, Hawaiian Can you do it on the contact page? Oh, awesome, dude. Right, I look forward to it. Okay, everybody. Um, oh. What's that? It is. It is. How'd, you, how'd, you, how'd you like that? It was, it was fun. I liked it a lot. Good, good. Awesome. Yeah, so well, we're about to like really do some of that right now. Um, I just realized that uh, normally I would ask if anyone had any um, questions for me, and I'm happy to answer them. Um, but we already started the demos. So if you want to talk to me, just come up to me or me or Jessica while we're doing all this, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. You can also go to voyagervr.com and ask questions there, too. OK, so you. Stefan. Stefan. All right, here we go. Yeah, why don't you get that one? So 
So also keep in mind, this is um, a very early alpha version of this. So if you explode like my principal, it is not my fault. No. I'll try my best. OK. Oh, so you've never done that? That's awesome. OK, cool. Because he's done it before, the, like, the guy that did it before this. OK, so. OK. All right, so the server is up. We're going to connect on there. You go ahead and put this on. Is it complicated? It should not be. What's your major? What are you doing? Wow. Oh. <laughs> There's that reaction David was looking for. What do you think so far? Whoa. Cool, huh? That's, yeah. Je that's Jessica over there. Oh my goodness. Okay. So. <laughs> Oh so goodness. this is okay. It's it's not a horror game. It's not a horror game. Okay, are you right-handed or left-handed? I am right-handed. Here you go. Wow. Oh my goodness. Okay. So now I'm gonna go over here. Do you love it or what? This is so weird. Oh my. Goodness. Okay. So if you walk forward, come here this way. You're gonna see a grid appear. Do you see a blue grid? No. Keep oh, going. Okay, so don't go past that, otherwise you're gonna run into people, okay? Wow. Yeah, we're gonna pass out. This is awesome. I'm so happy you're having a good experience. Okay, okay come this no, way. No, it's, it really is wow. Awesome, good. You're you're the kind of person I love, man. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna talk to you in there. So, so Steph Stefan? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. okay. So I'm going to jump on the computer here. I'm going to I'll play for a little bit. Okay, so Stefan. Look, look, look at me. Turn around. Oh my. Look at. So I'm this little girl here. Here. Let's see. Okay. Stefan, you're, st you're getting near the computer over there. Watch out, watch out. Okay. Okay. Breathe, breathe, Stefan. Breathe, Stefan. All right, are you ready to go to Egypt? You're all set? Okay, here we go. Oh, wait. No. Control shift three on that one. No, 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 not, sorry, I'm telling Jessica, our ca captain of the ship. Okay, okay, so we're, so in, we're Egypt in Egypt now, now Stefan. And, and I'm, I'm still, still here. here. Hello. 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 <laughs> would it would it make, would it make you feel more feel comfortable, more comfortable if, if I was C three PO? Oh yeah, that's just it's really quite bizarre. Quite bizarre, yeah. yeah. I don't know how to explain it, but Yeah, yeah. It's, it's about to get, get way, way more, more bizarre, bizarre, bro. Okay, okay so, so look at your remote. Look at your remote. And then, and then aim, aim the right, the right one, one at, the at the menu there. there. So, you so you want to click, click on, on the yellow, the yellow sun, sun. Oh, gotcha. with the trigger. With the trigger. Gotcha. And, now and now click, click on, on that, that clock. clock. Oh. Yeah. yeah. And now you're going to change the time of day. So look so up look at the up sky. At the sky. And then you and then can change, change the, the angle, angle too. too. Sun angle. Okay, so check this out, Stefan. Watch this. So I can build a pyramid. And then, hold on. Hold on. Okay, okay, so you, so can, you build can build two. two. So, so click the blue, the blue back, back button. button. Yep. 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 
and then the right, the stone, the top right, blue. And then now click with the trigger. Okay, so do you see the rainbow button? On the right remote? Use item. So that's gonna spawn an item. You push the, push the, uh, the rainbow button. Yeah. And now practice. Okay, wait a second. Sorry. So, wow. Your thumb here is yes. moving where that thing is. So move it back. This. Yeah. Oh. So now, if you push your thumb forward, it'll. Okay. Maybe let's just keep the hand off that for now, and then click on the pyramid again. So, so, okay, okay. Let's, start let's start over here. So, so click, click on, on like, like one, one of the, of the items. items. Like here? Mm-hmm. Okay. With, With the trigger. Oh, okay, oh, okay. okay. And, then and then keep your keep thumb your up thumb here, here. Like, 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 keep it. Keep it. Okay. Oh, gotcha. Like I said, like I said everybody, everybody, we're, we're still, still developing, developing this. this. So now so if now you press this, you will, you will spawn, spawn an, item. an item. But you're, you're yeah. yeah. But it's, but it's um, uh, so, so. <clears throat> sorry. sorry. Yeah, let's, let's go, go back, back this, this way. way. Okay. Wow. Okay. 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 So now, so now spawn, spawn that, that item. item. Yeah, make, yeah, a, make couple a couple of them. Of them. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay. Just keep Just doing keep it. Doing it. So you've got this, your thumb on this pad, moving this like that, it moves oh it forward goodness. and backward. Yeah. Do you okay. get that? Okay, try it. So try moving your thumb back now. It should start coming towards you. Just keep your thumb on it. There, it's coming, it's coming. Okay. You were getting it. We're getting, it takes a couple of minutes. It takes a couple of minutes. So don't be nervous. This is very, whoa. Okay, now pick a couple other items. Okay, so here, let's make this guy. Okay, okay, Stefan, so, so now. <laughs> You're like stuck in here, dude. What are you? Oh my god, we're. we're st yeah, this is quite the fort you've built for us here. Okay, well, luckily, I have a black hole that can erase things, so we can get out of here. Okay, yeah, so. I will show you how to run. So, so there's a button, the button this, this here, here. That'll, that'll move you, move you forward, forward and wherever, wherever you aim you this, it'll walk. My wow. So Stefan, yeah. so look so down look at your down remote, remote and then and click that, that, bla that blue button, button. The, the blue button, button the, the back, back button. button. Yeah, yeah, click that. that. Okay, okay, now look down. Yeah. And do you see the, um, the trash can on the bottom? Okay, below that is the little slider. Put it farther up. Yeah. Now you're going to be gigantic. So look how tiny I am now. <laughs> so, so now you're a giant, Stefan. And I need you to pick me up. So put your hand down. Put your hand down. On the ground, put your hand down on the ground. 
And I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm going to jump on there. Wait, hold on. Am I on? OK, pick me up, pick me up. You could throw me. That'd be mean, though. How do I do that? Um, you just would throw me, but just don't throw the. <laughs> Man, this is weird. Where am I in the room? In the center. OK. OK, now grab one of those, those, those walls with the trigger. So reach down and grab it. Like, stick your hand inside one of those walls and click the trigger. Yep, now click the, okay. So now grab it with the other trigger. So you're holding, no, 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 just one item. And then stretch it, stretch it out. You can shrink it and make it bigger. Just the trigger. Just one trigger. Oh, oh, you can't do that. That's only when you're spawning the item. So, okay. Let's um let's get someone else in there, yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. What's that, Jeff? Huh? Oh yeah, okay. We're just one more thing, Stefan. Click on the paint bucket, the purple. And then select a color. And then use that same rainbow button and start painting. That is bizarre. That's so cool. That is so cool. Thank you. I'm shooting you, Stefan. <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, does someone else want to try? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, cool, cool, cool. I'm going to grab your headset, and then you can take the headset off. Who wants to go next? Man. That's so weird. You? Yeah. Is David, or is that who you're talking to? Delaney? Get over here, Delaney. Let's, it, it's going to be fun, I promise. OK. So I admire your courage. Um, you know, one thing I've noticed is people, like, they go, oh, I got self-conscious because everyone was watching me or whatever. Don't, no one cares. I don't care. Yeah, OK, good. Good. All right, so I'm going to reset. Oh, we are falling through the floor. There we go. How are we looking there? So, and then, real quick. Oh, sorry. So, okay. Um, so this big button, oh, I think we're blocking this. Let's turn this way. So this big button here is going to teleport you and then let go. And then this trigger is what's going to um, like grab, stuff. grab stuff. And then this button here is that rainbow button I was talking about. So that's going to like spawn items and stuff. OK, cool. <laughs> All right. You got it. Are you right-handed or left-handed? Right-handed. So right hand there. All right, I'm going to come up behind you and put these headphones on. So, so Delaney. Delaney. Yes. OK, how you doing? So just look around here. And then here I am, hello. 
How's it going? So yeah, why don't you practice moving around? What do you think so far? OK. So go ahead and look at the remote and then click on that sun. Uh, yeah. Trigger. And then change that time of day there. So I want to show you something, Delaney. So we're so going to hit this, this and then and click, click on, on save and load. load. Like, so, so aim it down. It down. Um, oh, oh, I think oh, I might be oh, blocking. blocking. There we go. There we okay. go. Okay. okay. Click on click that. that. And then load. load. And then and I, I think, think it's, it's the, the one in the top. In the, oh, no, wait. Yeah, that one there. Yeah, the far top right. And then look around. Oh, there it is. Yeah, okay, cool. So and then, so uh, come with me this way, Delaney, towards the pyramid. <laughs> Follow me. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so go ahead and make yourself big. So look down. There we go. So try grabbing stuff. Like grab that palm tree there. You got to get close to it, teleport into it in front of it. No, you're good. No, you're Stick good. your hand in there. <laughs> here we go. Here we go. Watch it. Here. I'm going to drop some stuff for you. Hold on here. Here, watch this. Let's see here. Um, here, I'm going to make some bricks for you to play with. Those you can grab and throw. So reach down and grab them. Yeah, you got to stick your hand in them. Close up. No, no, no just reach down and grab it. You gotta stick your hand in it. There you go. <laughs> you make it foggy. Okay, what? Make it dark and wet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they are flaming earths.
Here, Jess, come over. Yeah, why don't you play with her for a little bit? Definitely did. He definitely yeah. did. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, that's a big earth there. Oh, geez. They do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, have her pick you up. Oh yeah, yeah, shoot an earth now. Yeah, shoot her on the earth. <laughs> uh, sadly, you can't ride the... Uh... <laughs> I'm gonna see if... Uh... I can't remember if destruction mode is on here or not, but let me see. I'm gonna try loading something else. I can't remember. Let's see if this works. Okay, so now we're at Stonehenge. Okay, we're here at Stonehenge. Can you look down? Yeah, click on that. Uh, do the Earth thing again. Yeah, so the red button. Oh, and then try clicking on that, the fireball in the middle there. Click that. Yeah. And now shoot it at those. At, so. I made a destruction mode one day when I was bored, so blow it. <laughs> shoot the earth at that. Let's see if the uh, the spaceship works. So look down at the remote again. Look down more. See that spaceship there, uh, in the right next to the trash can. Oh yeah. Click that. Oh, okay. So you're in the ground. That's okay. So hold the trigger down and aim. And now you're flying the spaceship. Oh. So wherever you aim the remote, you'll go. <laughs> David, you gonna try this? No? 
Okay. Why don't you give it a shot? Yeah, let's give it a shot. Come on. All right, Delaney. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm gonna come up. Okay. I'm gonna come up behind you. So I can adjust um, the distance from the lenses. If it doesn't fit, it should fit though. Mm -hmm. We've had multiple people like, do this in the lens. Stefan. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Of course. It was, it was very, very cool. So trippy. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah right? Yeah. Isn't like, it? You're in there. You're hearing these voices around you. Look to see what's there. And there's nothing. Thank you. That was really cool. Thank really, you. I'm glad really you liked well. it. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Of course. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Bye, ladies. Oh, yeah, here, let's try it. Here, let me see. So I'm gonna, so yeah, you can, um, you pull this out, and then you can, um, let's see, how do you, oh yeah, there we go. See, now the lenses are getting further away, so your glasses won't touch them. Mm. Yeah. And Try um, that. There's actually a Kickstarter going around right now um, for prescription lenses, so you don't have to wear your glasses. You can uh, change them out for whatever your prescription is. Oh, okay. A no-go? Yeah. What's wrong? Uh, my glasses are too wide, I think. They're that's too wide? wide? Yeah. Oh. That's... I think that was the problem I had. Oh, that's like, crazy. Um, have face you face tried face just face looking face at it without face. the glasses? It's super blurry. Okay. Try it without. Yeah. You tighten these really quick just so it doesn't happen. Because I, I have to wear contacts, mm. and I can see just fine without the glasses. Yeah, it's really blurry. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay, okay, okay. Well, well maybe problem. you can get glasses that aren't so wide. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you. That's I was telling him unfortunate. That's yeah, there's, oh, yeah, you can get prescription lenses. In the actual headset. Mm -hmm. um, you would order them separately, and they would, because these pop out. Yeah, these pop out. Yeah. What do you guys want to do? And, um, Anybody else want to try it? Yo, oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You will be next. Thanks for filming, by the way. All right. So, what do you here for school for? I'm in VBA. Oh, okay. Cool. So you do a little bit of computer design stuff then? Yeah, I love software. Oh, nice. That's what uh, Wesley is teaching you, huh? Nice. Okay, cool. I'm kind of wondering what the state of like people with glasses is. Have you done VR before? No. Okay. So, okay, are you uh, right or left handed? Right handed. Okay, so this is going to go in your right hand. <laughs> and then, for some reason, this one's not detecting. Let me restart it. Oh, I remember now. Okay. Here you go.
So, okay, go ahead and take this, and you're gonna aim it at this, and you're gonna pull the trigger. So aim it at that red, um, the red fireball thing. Yeah, and then pull the trigger. So click with the trigger. So it's this one. Uh, is it not working? Hmm. Is there a menu up? Like, is the screen all gray? What do you see right now? I see like a blue screen. You see a blue screen? Yeah. Okay, that's why you can't. Okay, so did it go away now? Yeah. Okay, so now try. There we go. Now click the fireball. Sorry. Do you model these in Maya? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I thought it was, there was something else to it. And then you're going to press the rainbow button there. So shoot now. Destruction, destruction mode. mode. It's very satisfying. We don't advertise destruction mode. Uh -oh. 